There we go. There we go. Welcome everyone as you're coming on board. Oh my goodness, wow, already 67, awesome. Wow. Welcome everyone, welcome. For our panelists, if you can see, we're now up to almost 150 people coming in and the numbers are, <laughs> it's like watching a tally board. You know, I'm so excited that so many people are joining us tonight. So I'm just going to let, um, yeah, this is a really, really exciting. So um, as people are coming in, um, we're going to give just like a minute or two for, for people to come in. If you're coming in and you um, just want to tell us if you are, where you're coming from, if you're coming from New York, if you're coming from outside of New York, we would love to know, um, you know, where you're coming from. Um, Oh, we have people from Cicero, from Baltimore, Casanova, Syracuse, a lot of central New Yorkers, Cortland. Wonderful. Oh, San Rafael, California. So East Syracuse, Binghamton, Liverpool. Wonderful. Wonderful. So great. Yes. And we have now hit like over the 200 marks from Colorado. Welcome, Colorado. Welcome, California. Mm -hmm. Dallas. Um, and thank you all for being here, Vero Beach, Utica. Um, thank you. So we have a lot of wonderful people who are uh, Central New Yorkers joining us here tonight. Um, I am going to get this party started. My name is Joanne Yarrow. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Education here at Syracuse Stage in Syracuse, New York. And we have a very exciting Syracuse stories for you today. Um, we are joined by CNY Reads um, with uh, Wendy Davenport. Wendy, say hello. hello. Welcome everyone. <laughs> yes, and also Alan Napier. Hello, Alan. Thanks for coming. And our uh, guest of honor this evening, Elizabeth Letts, who is the author of Finding Dorothy, who we're going to have a chat with today. And welcome, Elizabeth. Welcome to uh, all of our guests here in Central New York and around the United States. And um, Elizabeth, tell us just a little bit about yourself. What got you to this place? You know, the how you how how did we how did we find Elizabeth Letts? <laughs> I mean. Probably the, the most important thing you know need to know about me was that when I was a little girl, I had an imaginary friend named Dorothy. Um, seeing the, the wonderful Wizard of Oz, seeing the movie when I was four years old with my family at a television store because we didn't have a color TV um, was a really a remarkable experience in my life. Um, I fell in love with the, the story, the cast of characters, through the movie, not through the book. It was very much later that I actually discovered uh, the story of Frank and Maude and, and realized that it was a story that I wanted to tell. Um, but definitely, I am a Wizard of Oz fanatic. Wonderful, wonderful. And how, how just just a little bit, uh, a little bit more about history, like how long, and uh, what, what number book is this? Uh, how, how, what other books have you written? And um, uh -huh. tell us a little bit about that as well. Sure, well, you know what? I, I, I was a late bloomer as a writer. I, I knew that I wanted to be a writer from the time I was really a little girl. Um, I, I remember as long as I can remember. But um, when I was growing up, I, after I graduated from college, I joined the Peace Corps. I went off and I did a lot of different things. And honestly, I didn't write my first book until I was 40 years old. Um, when my best friend from college called me and she said, guess what, Elizabeth, I wrote a book. And I said, wait, that was, that was my dream. So I decided that I wasn't going to let, you know, that I didn't want to be one of those people who thought she had a book in her and never wrote it. And I sat down and I wrote my very first book then. It was the year 2000. Um, I didn't actually publish that first book right away. Uh, I published another one, but that was the beginning. And I think I am up to 10 books now. Um, so I write fiction and nonfiction. I think I've written four novels and three nonfiction books. And then I have th also three children books, children's books. Okay, so there, there's still hope for us yet. <laughs> it's never too late, I promise. It's never too late. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, just for our panelists, we're, we're going to be asking some questions, but there is a Q&A uh, section in the, in the Zoom. If you want to put a question in, I will be moderating some of the questions as we come along. 
Um, and also to let um, uh, us know that um, Finding Dorothy is the, uh, our annual CNY Reads book. So um, Wendy and Alan have been doing a lot of activities around uh, Finding Dorothy and, uh, and there are still more to come. And so one of the first questions um, that we have is, you said you do fiction and nonfiction. What is your research project when you're writing you know, a historical novel? Do you have research assistants? Do you visit the places that you mentioned? And, and especially with this book, which is a blend of fiction and nonfiction. Yes. So how did you come about it? Well, it's interesting. I started out writing fiction. I never really saw myself as a nonfiction writer per se, um, but I ended up writing some nonfiction because I found, I found one specific story that was a true story that I wanted to tell. But I think uh, with historical fiction, which is what Finding Dorothy is. It is, a really, it is a really kind of fascinating and tricky endeavor, the way that you take a, a story that is true and then make it your own and create historical fiction out of it. And, and people often ask me the difference, you know, what is the difference between historical nonfiction and historical fiction, especially when you're writing about real people? And I, I, the way that I perceive the answer to that question is that there are stories that history cannot fully tell. And, and I think this is particularly true when you're talking about the lives of women. Many of the most important uh, aspects of women's lives are not public. They're not written about in the newspapers and uh, presidents and, and senators and wars and generals more now, but especially in the past, a lot of women's lives and their importance was kind of hidden from you, the, the woman behind the man, and there was a lot of privacy. So this is why historical fiction sometimes can illuminate a story in a new way and make it more accessible to us. So if you take the case of Finding Dorothy, we have some true facts. We have um, a man named L. Frank Baum. He you know, led a life. He married a woman named Maud Gage. Uh, his mother-in-law was a very, very famous and radical suffragist. Um, he had many influences in his life. And then um, he wrote the book that is known as America's homegrown fairy tale, uh, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. So these are, these are known things. Um, what, we, what we don't know though, is what was it exactly like to, to live Frank Baum's life? And, and in more particular, my focus in Finding Dorothy what was it like to be married to Frank Baum? And we do know a lot about Maud uh, Baum because um, there's been a lot of historical interest in Frank and in Matilda and in Maud. So we do have quite a bit of biography and, and that is really important and essential work. Where the historical novelist comes in is you read all of that, but now you want to, you want to find an emotional truth inside the story. And I don't, I don't make up things, if, if something is already known and, and it's known to be a fact, I don't, I don't discard that and, and make up something completely different. I try to work within the parameters, but every time that you know Frank and Maude go behind closed doors and they shut the door, that opens a window for fiction. And I took a lot of inspiration from Frank Baum himself because Frank believed that, uh, he really believed that, that Oz was a real place and he really believed that it was a failure of our own imagination, that we couldn't see these other worlds that were right around us like Oz. You know, you just had to be able to see. Oh, I'm unable to hear you. I didn't say anything, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> so, well, I'm talking about Frank Baum. And, and he, he had this idea that there were these worlds around us. And if you could just kind of, you know, it's like, a, he called it like a thin, a, a gauzy curtain. And if you could just pull back this gauzy curtain, you could see this brilliant world that was just on the other side of it. So that's how I think about, about the world of fiction. That It's like Frank is on the other side of that curtain and Maud and, and, and Matilda, and they're, they're calling to me and they're saying, you don't know what, what happened, but we do. Come on in and we'll tell you. Um, so it's kind of a melding of, of history and imagination. Um, do I use research assistance? No, no I don't. And oh. I did visit most of the places uh, that I 
talk about in the book, but I never made it to Syracuse. So, um, yeah. Well, you have an open invitation then. <laughs> no, thank you. I would love to. <laughs> um, uh, Alan, did you have a question? I have a couple of questions here, but I didn't know if you I had do have a question. question. She already answered the one I was going to ask her, which was if she'd ever been to Syracuse. But the other one I wanted to ask you is, <clears throat> excuse me, the book opens with Maude going to MGM. She wants to make sure that the movie is true to the story. And um, I just read The Wizard of Oz for the first time because of Finding Dorothy. So I just read it about six weeks ago. And it is quite different, the book, from the movie on, on many levels. Like in all movies, there are things in the book that they didn't include in the movie. Mm -hmm. And they also changed some things. And it is much scarier, which Maude was concerned about. And uh, mm -hmm. the movie is much scarier than the, than the book was. And I guess my question to you is, do you think Maude really would have given the film her blessing considering how different it was from the book? Um, you know, Maude, I think it was, it's interesting with Maude because, and I, I think it came across very well in in Finding Dorothy that that Maude was actually really kind of a, a realist and a practical person. And she had been, she lived in Hollywood and they had been around entertainment and they had been around Hollywood for a long time. And so um, when, when Maude was asked what she thought you know, how closely she thought the movie was going to stay to the book. She was actually pretty skeptical about it. She didn't really, oh. she knew enough about what, what would happen that I don't think that she would have been completely surprised if it was different. But I do think that with Maude, what was really important for her was to, um, to protect the essence of, of what was really important to Frank in the movie and to make sure that that was preserved. Um, and because, because The Wizard of Oz was a story of ideas. Um, and Frank, you know, he wrote and created in the form of, you know, in the children's literature, but he was a, a man of, of high purpose. He had many ideas. Many of his ideas were really the, the ideas of his wife and his mother-in-law that he had taken in and, and become to believe about the equality of women. Um, and so I think that that was something that Maud felt it was really important um, that the movie not be turned into something that it wasn't. Um, but it's the Hollywood version. Um, and interestingly enough, I think that that of all of the parts of the film that Frank would have objected to the most was was at the very end when Dorothy's in Kansas and she wakes up and she realizes the whole thing is a dream because really, that wasn't it. I mean, Frank really did believe that there were that there was another world out there. Uh, you know, he he, and not to say that he was crazy or something like that, but he just had this really strong belief that we didn't know everything about what was out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that Oz represents it. And so having her wake up and have it be a dream was a little bit of a cop out in a way. I think I had that same impression uh, that uh, that that would have probably bothered him. So yeah. Uh huh. And there's a little bit of kind of oh, poor Dorothy at the end, which is very much not part of her character. Um, you know, the whole, the whole idea of, of home, I mean, is expressed in the book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, but it isn't really, um, you know, one of the things that um, was very important to the Gage family was this idea that uh, women should be independent, that they should not be tied to home and hearth and, and family, that they, that they should be able to be actors on, this, on the, the stage of life. So um, there was a little bit of Hollywood piety that comes into the end of the movie there where it's like, oh, you know, Dorothy's come home and it was all a bad dream. I don't think Frank and Maude would have, would have told the story quite that way. Yeah. That was, that was actually some of the questions that we had. So you actually answered some of those questions. Um, I, I do have a couple of questions here. Um, I'll ask both. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is how long did it take you to write Finding Dorothy? And how do you decide what words to put in a real person's mouth? Well, those are really nice questions. The first one, um, so because I now write one book after another, uh, I end up working on one while I'm finishing another. So uh, with Finding Dorothy, I think from inspiration to completion, it was about three, 
three years or so, um, that was not all writing. I don't find for myself that the actual writing of the book, putting words on paper is the, the most time consuming part. For me, it is learning enough about the world to be able to bring it to life in a realistic way. So research um, and editing, but just composing probably is one of the, the, the faster parts of it for me. I kind of, I have four kids and uh, when I first started writing, actually for the first 10 or 12 years of my career, um, I also worked full-time as a nurse midwife. Um, now that I think about that, I can't quite process it myself, but I learned to be highly, highly, highly efficient when I write. I mean, there was no candles. There was no, I didn't have a desk actually a lot of the time. There was no muse, nothing. I just sat down and started typing. Um, and I'm still, you know, now fortunately I don't have to do that and I could support myself as a full-time writer, but um, it did make me highly efficient. But learning about history is a very time consuming task. And if you think about finding Dorothy, um, you know, I've never written a book that at, after I finished it that I didn't get feedback from somebody that there was something that I didn't get right, you know? Um, because it, but, but on every page, you know, almost every paragraph, I may have to learn about, uh, about something. So I remember when I was writing, um, you know, when Maude had to get from her home to Cornell, I had to find out how the trains worked. And when Frank was um, going to invite Maude to come to the theater to see him put on, um, a play, I had to find out everything about the theater, but then I had to find out about how theaters worked in those days, even the lighting and the seats and the, so there's a, a lot of research that goes into that. Um, now, as far as the, the second part of the question, which is how do you decide what words to put in people's mouths? And I mean, I think when you're writing historical fiction, it's kind of a mix. Very often with Matilda in particular, so this is Frank and Maud's mother-in-law, the famous suffragist Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Um, this is a woman who had a lot to say. And what I found interesting was that sometimes when I would have Matilda say something that she actually did say, that I took verbatim from text, um, it, my, my editor would flag it and say, I'm not sure this is appropriate for the time. Is this, are you sure this is appropriate for the time? As if people in, in that time maybe weren't even thinking those things. And, and that was the thing with Matilda. She was so far out and ahead in, in terms of the kinds of things that she thought and wrote about that they seem like, you, you gotta be kidding, in the 19th century. Um, but for dialogue, it, it's quite different. If I'm writing nonfiction, which I also do, um, if it is in quotes as something that somebody says, I either took it from an interview or from a written source. But when you're writing fiction, part of what you're doing is you're recreating scenes where you really don't know what the person said. And so in that case, it's a question of building a believable character. If you believe that Maud or Frank would have said it, I'm doing my job right. If you're kind of like, oh, you know, uh, from what I know about that character, that doesn't seem quite right, then I'm not doing my job right. And I'm sure all of us have had that experience of reading historical fiction and all of a sudden, you know, we, we pick up the book and then we're reading and we slam it shut and, you know, throw it back on the table because the character doesn't ring true. Um, so it's, that's what it's about. It's about trying to make the character as believable as possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wendy, did you have a, a question? Uh, you have to. Okay. First of all, um, I loved all the examples of foreshadowing that you used so that we saw the scarecrow, we saw how Oz came about, um, the, the uh, fair in Chicago and the Emerald City, and there were just so many wonderful things that you did with foreshadowing that I loved. And I've read the book more than once because I wanted to make sure I was totally comfortable with it when I led the discussions, facilitated discussions. Um, a couple of questions that came up during our discussions. One, uh, did Maude actually spend time on set? We saw the publicity photo with her and Judy Garland, but did they really know each other? I think, you know, a lot of the reason that I was able to write this story is because not very much is really known about what Maude did um, at the movie. And because of that, probably of the entire book, the interactions between Judy and Maude are the ones that are most firmly in the fictional realm. And really that was what did draw me to this story in the first place. Um, I saw that picture of Judy and Maude together 
And I thought, I was very much struck by it in, in so many ways. Uh, a young woman who's just on the cusp of becoming, you know, a worldwide uh, icon, but, but is still kind of a child. And then Maud, who is an older woman, perhaps at this time at, in 1938, 1939, very difficult for someone of her age in that place and time to really make her voice heard. And yet I knew that she was a very strong-minded person who wanted to make her voice heard. And then Maud, having been raised, you know, a whole two generations before Judy, uh, believing that she could be as independent as she could be. And then Judy, in her own way, very, very independent. She was actually supporting her family financially. She had a high paid job for a 15 year old girl in, in the Great Depression. Um, and, and, and yet she was functioning within a structure that was absolutely patriarchal and, and designed to keep her down in so many different ways. But you know, you see that picture and you think if I could have been a fly on the wall and listen to what they were talking about. Now, did they have a, a very developed friendship? There's really no way to know. I mean, even even um, the people who know the most about the movie, it's, it wasn't written about. Was it not written about because because people weren't interested in Maud? Because she was just the widow of the, the, the author of the book? Was it not written about because she was in fact not as involved as I portray in fiction, it's kind of hard to know. But um, I, she was definitely there. She and she was uh, definitely uh, given the role of helping to promote and advertise the film and be involved in the marketing ventures um, that we know for sure. And another question people asked, um, if it was really Frank's cult, or is that just a myth? Is there any way to know that it was his cult? Well, you know, I'm going to say yes, it was definitely Frank's cult. Um, <laughs> you know, there is no way to know. And um, I, I dug as deep into that as I could. And, and essentially it was, it was documented at the time. I mean, that it was the film's publicist and Maude also vouched for the coat's um, origin and said that it was Frank's coat. So this is not a story that I made up. Um, it, it's not so far-fetched in the fact that when you hear it, you think, well, how on earth would Frank Baum's coat end up on the set of MGM until you find out that they lived in Hollywood. And, and, and so is it possible? I mean, Maude being thrifty took Frank's old coat down to the thrift store and the, so, I mean, I don't know, but I mean, I'm sticking to yes. I was struck by Judy's courage for a young girl. It's, it was in her biography, she said herself that Mr. Mayor touched her inappropriately. He would put her hand on her heart and say, yes. you're seen from the heart. And, and, and she let, allowed that a couple of times. And then she finally said, please don't do that again, Mr. Mayor. I won't allow it. Mm -hmm. Well, grown women actresses who wouldn't say no to him. But right. as, as a young girl, she, that was quite a, a, a strong uh, trait, you know, uh, and, and, and yes. a strong action, yeah. Yes, um, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that what gets lost sometimes with Judy Garland is because we know what a tragic life she led. Mm -hmm. um, it is in fact true that she was put on diet pills during the filming of The Wizard of Oz. Um, they would give her you know, uh, amphetamines during the day to pump her up so that she could work all day. And then they would put them in the infirmary and give them barbiturates at night to help them sleep. That's all true. And the amount of pressure that was on her, I think, and it's one of the things that I, I like to point out about The Wizard of Oz in particular was the fact that it was, um, you know, it was a very difficult movie to be resting on the shoulders of a 15 year old girl. She was 16, 15 at the time they started filming um, because it was a huge budget film. And I, I think you might be interested, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background about, um, about the history of why MGM decided to film The Wizard of Oz. Um, what had happened was there was actually a, a very, very, very big Hollywood hit in 1937 that was based on a fantasy story. And it was uh, made by Disney and it was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It was extremely, successful from a money-making point of view, but it was animated. Well, Disney Studios were way out ahead in terms of their capacity to do animation, but 
MGM Studios was considered the kind of the gold standard of Hollywood studios. And they considered themselves the premier. And Louis V. Mayer wanted to take on Disney head on. And he wanted to see if you could do a live action fantasy movie. Now, from our perspective in 2021 with CGI, obviously, you know, we, we're used to seeing worlds explode and, you know, cities collapse and everything. But when they, at that time, it was a real question. Can you make a movie like The Wizard of Oz uh, with the technology that they had at the time? How were you going to make the, uh, the house fly up in the air? How are you going to have a tornado on set? I mean, they didn't know the answers to any of those questions. But first and foremost, the biggest marketing problem with that movie was that it was about a little girl and for you know, people who were wearing costumes, or so we have a lion, we have a scarecrow, we have a tin man, and we have a little girl, and we have a dog. Um, and those are the stars of the movie. And just like today, it was a star system at the studio. So they didn't have a Clark Gable to, to hang that movie around. Who were they going to hang the movie around? Well, their first thought was the biggest, there was one very, very big bankable child star in the 1930s, and that was Shirley Temple. And so they did actually think about trying to get Shirley Temple, which is kind of like, think about that. Uh, Judy Garland was already um, on the payroll at MGM. She had been making movies. She was always kind of cast as the, um, you know, the, 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 the nice girl who doesn't get the boy. She was not considered beautiful. Um, and, but she had this shocking, shockingly brilliant voice. And they decided, okay, we're gonna try to see if we can hang this movie around this relatively unknown, not considered pretty, thought to be overweight girl. Um, and it was a big, big, um, big budget movie because there was a lot riding on this, um, this idea that can MGM make this live action fantasy? And they put millions of dollars out. All of that was on Judy, all of that. So my point being to come back to your question, is that knowing what a tragic and difficult life Judy had, I do think that we have run the danger of forgetting that she was a pioneer and in many ways, an incredibly strong young woman because yeah, the studio system was terrible to women and, and still is. I mean, up to now, when we finally come to the Me Too movement, uh, back then though, she wasn't going to say anything. She was going to accept that because she, because she, partly because she had this transcendent talent, but partly because she was supporting her family and, and she was making a living for them. And so the strength of those women back then who would work within that system um, and take all of that pressure on themselves is, is remarkable. And I think it's very important not to lose sight of it. And, 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 and then you've got the strong women on the, on the bottom of the gauge side. And so there was some connection there. And that was really what I saw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a, a lot of questions pouring okay. in. So I'm going to just ask a few of them. Um, and uh, we may not get to all of them just because of time is limited. But thank you all for these amazing questions. One, just along those lines of what you were talking about, did you have to get permission to speak for Judy Garland or any of the other famous people that you... Yeah. Oh yes, no. When you're writing nonfiction, if a person is, um, if a person is, they don't. If the person is dead, you know, any you can write a million stories about Judy Garland if you want to. If they're if they're fiction, um, I don't know the ins and outs when it comes into something like making a movie. Sometimes the it's different because sometimes the, I mean, you can't write. I couldn't write a story that was based on the Wizard of Oz with Judy as as the character of Dorothy. And some of those things are trademarked by, um, by MGM, et cetera. So there's, it can be really complicated, but if there's a story in history, anybody's allowed to tell that story. You can tell it and, and, and you all can tell it too. You know, you can tell you, you can write 18 versions of Finding Dorothy and that's all fine. And, and someone asks, is the story about Over the Rainbow true? The song story about Over the Rainbow. The, the part about, about the inspiration Mm -hmm. um, coming the way that it came to them. Um, yes, that is true. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. And um, I'm just gonna pop in a couple more. These are, um, uh, one of them is, um, 
Uh, first of all, uh, we have some people who have actually uh, uh, shared who said she visited Matilda's plot today and she was listening to Finding Dorothy and she just wants to say thank you. She feels very proud to be an upstate New Yorker. And, um, and how did you do the research, being that you haven't been to, re to Syracuse, how did you do, um, how did you know the area enough to write about the area geographically? What is your process for mm -hmm. that? So, um, well, I, the first thing is I just want to say thank you to this to this uh, reader because that gave me chills and it made me really really thrilled to hear that. Um, and as far as the research process, so I actually do try to visit every place that I um, that I'm writing about, and I did actually think that it would be better if I could visit Syracuse, um, but I wasn't able to. So my research process when I can't visit a place because of time or, or timing is, um, it, it, it's really what I do is I, I mean, I guess to start out with, because I'm writing history, you can't visit Syracuse in 1880 even now. So the way that you visit places that don't exist anymore, whether that be the land of Oz or Syracuse in the past, is through uh, printed and written sources. So I use maps, I use a lot of contemporary written sources from the time and I pour over them. And, and still apologies to every single person in the audience who was reading anything about Syracuse and thought mm, that's not quite quite right. It is very, very hard to get it exactly, exactly right. But generally speaking, some people feel, I was, um, I was listening to Paula McLean uh, speak. She was the author of a book called The Paris Wife. And I thought it was really fascinating. She said she didn't visit Paris at all while she was writing it because she didn't want her, the image of Paris in the 1920s to be erased by, by the contemporary Paris. So there really, there is something to that. And many of the places that I've written about extensively, you can't visit them anymore. An example would be my book, The $80 Champion. A lot of that takes place in um, at the National Horse Show in Madison Square Garden in New York City. Well, that Madison Square Garden that existed in the late 1950s is not the current day Madison Square Garden. But my mother went to Madison Square Garden and actually many living people were, you know, the story didn't take place so long ago that nobody saw it. So I had to write about something that people had been present at, though I wasn't even born yet. And then they come back and say, I was there. And it's such a great feeling to me. If, if somebody who has seen the place that I'm talking about and, and feels that I did a good job with it, um, that is the greatest compliment to me. And sometimes I think, you know, sometimes I, I know that uh, I can't quite even remember what it was, but early with this book of Finding Dorothy, somebody told me um, that I had I had them leaving Frank's house and heading in the wrong direction to get back to Fayetteville. Um, that they should have turned right and that they turned left or something I can't remember now. And that's the type of mistake you make. That's wonderful. So uh, you, you, it's so wonderful because you're answering questions, other questions that are coming in. Peggy had said she loved $80 Champion and, and you answered some of the questions regarding your research on that. Um, we have a lot of questions about, um, I'm just gonna pop up about, you know, what happened with Maud's family? What happened with Maud's niece, the bomb children? Do you know anything um, that mm -hmm. about the family afterwards. Yeah, actually, it's one of the, the coolest things about writing this book was um, that I have had the opportunity to meet some of the bomb descendants. Um, and that has been really, really interesting for me. And that, I guess that's too, you know, you have this feeling of like, oh my gosh, you know, here's a bomb descendant. And what are they going to say to me? And what's interesting usually is that what I found mostly they said, we're really happy that you did this because some of these things, we didn't necessarily really know our own um, family history, because you're talking now, it goes back four to five generations. Um, but so that I thought that was that was really, really cool. Um, and they're as nice as can be. And, and, and then you think like, I don't know, like I thought they seemed Frank and Maud like, like I could feel the family connection or something. And did you ever get a chance to go visit the Wizard of Oz set? I was, I did go to MGM, yes. Um, and I, of course it's, um, it's not MGM anymore, it's Sony Pictures, but a lot of it does look a lot the same. Um, you can really get a, a good feeling. There's a, there's a rainbow. They have a rainbow that, that is, uh, when you go and take the, the Sony Pictures tour, there's a rainbow that you walk under. And, um, you know, the Thalberg building where some of the scenes in the book takes place, um, 
you're able to, you know, you can see all of that and everything. And, um, but a lot of too, I should say, um, again, I had a, an interesting connection to Judy Garland, which was that my mother had by very strange chance met Judy Garland twice. And um, when she was a very little girl, her father was in the Navy and he was stationed in San Diego. And they got invited to come up to MGM to watch a movie being filmed. And it was not The Wizard of Oz, but it was a Judy Garland film. I think it was Meet Me in St. Louis. And so she went in and, and as a little girl and she was in the stands. And so the my descriptions of what it was like to be on set and watching, some of that was based on you know other books and people who had written about it. But some of that was based on how what just things that my mother said, oh, you had to go up these stairs and you sat on this thing in the back that looked like scaffolding. Um, and so that was... That was uh, part of how I described it. That's, that's exciting. Uh, you have, I have a lot of people in the chat going, thank you, thank you. Your, your descriptions were wonderful. They live five minutes away. Um, and uh, they, lots of uh, people thanking you for how well you described it. Um, uh, Frank uh, left ties with Syracuse. I have a playbill from when he performed a play. Hold on, it's going all over there. Um, in Chittenango, 20, 20 minutes away or an hour from Ithaca, your descriptions were entirely believable to me. And I could imagine it all very vividly in my mind's eye. Oh, and that's so lovely. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And I, I did mention that really, Frank, um, he really was more than anything, a theater person. That was where he started. That was his great love. Um, I feel like he wrote books. But if he could have done nothing but be in the theater, I think that's what he would have done. And oh. movies, you know, he just he was a little too young for movies, you know, he just didn't quite get there. So, but I really do appreciate that. It's very kind. And, and the other thing too, that I haven't said, which is pertinent to your audience about Syracuse is, I think it is really important to know that without um, Syracuse, without your part of the world, there would have been no, no Wizard of Oz. So, and I'm, I'm sure you already have a great deal of, of local pride in this already, because it's such an incredibly fascinating place with the birth of the women's movement and so many interesting, such an interesting cauldron of ideas. And if you look at that, that is the crucible from which Frank Baum's ideas came. And I do believe that that is why the wonderful Wizard of Oz has endured and why the movie has become so important in our culture that we can hardly have a conversation about politics without somebody saying the man behind the curtain, we're not in Kansas anymore. Um, you know, that's, it doesn't ever mention uh, Central New York in the book, but if you want to look at what, where those ideas came from, it, that's where they come from, from this very fertile, interesting place that, that came, you know, created so many ideas. Um, and so I think that's there, you know, the stamp of Syracuse is very clearly marked in that book. Alan, Wendy, do you have any other? <laughs> We've got so many questions going here, but do you have any other questions as well? I have a, a kind of a, a question, or maybe I, I'm searching for a comment, but childbirth was very risky in the late 1800s, and many children uh, died, and many women died during childbirth. And not only that, it was, it was sometimes very difficult to raise a child to adulthood. They lost children when they were young. And I'm thinking about your history as a nurse midwife. If, if when you're doing your research and you're reading about these things, Frank lost several siblings. So did his Aunt Mary. His Aunt Mary yes. lost like four or five of her children. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that touched you differently, having been a midwife, uh, maybe more deeply than you think. Mm -hmm. than, than it would I, I think, you know, I, I really appreciate that question so much. And, and I think you might be the first person who's ever brought that up. But yes, absolutely. So in Frank's life, I, I, I believe he was, there were nine siblings and I think five of them died before adulthood. And, um, but with Maud, the thing that really struck me so much with Maud that I do talk about in the book was I'm reading her biography and it says, you know, kind of in passing that after the birth of her second child that she had, she was ill with this disease and she almost couldn't, almost didn't survive. Well, being a midwife, I knew that what was wrong with her was something that people, even, even now, even the 21st century, you can die. If you die, you might die of peritonitis because of a childbirth infection. And so that really, really struck me hard. I thought, here's this woman, she's had her first child 
she has now she has the second one and she becomes so deathly ill that it's truly a miracle that she survived. And it was extremely touching to hear about, to read some of the stories about Frank and how he took over, this is, this is true, how he took over some of the childcare of, of her older child um, because she was just so, the, the, well, the, the older child and a baby, she was so sick she couldn't function for almost two years. And then she went on and had two more children, terrifying, because I'm sure that, you know, the doctor at that point would have said no more children. And um, she could have just as easily died. And we do forget the, you know, we forget the kind of the tremendous impact of that. People did not know if they were going to live through childbirth and they did not know if their children were going to live to adulthood. And it was this, um, you know, there, there they were fighting for rights for women and votes for women in part because people like Matilda understood that you couldn't, you had to fix everything for women. You had to fix, you had to, you had to make women safe so that they would live and their children would live. And she wanted to break it all down and start over and build a whole new society that would be better for women. And, and we're distant from that now. But did I notice that? And did I think about it more because of being a midwife? I mean, I think, yes, yes, I do. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time reading about childbirth in 19th century and learning every medical fact in that book between everything about the birth and also everything about the, the, the baby's death on, was all taken from uh, Julia, Maud's sister's diary very, very precisely and accurately. So all that medical stuff, absolute facts. Mm. Mm. I have a quick, I have another question just a, a kind of along those lines, which sure. is the, the relationship. We have two questions, that, uh, um, which goes about the relationship between Matilda and Maud. Um, you know, with uh, Maud's, you know, main focus having been a suffragette, you know, how Maud, was she, uh, and this is Maud being almost embarrassed or, or how, how they did worked out the work-life balance mm -hmm. and in that time and how it affected their relationship. Mm -hmm. So what, what did you come across with that? I thought that, I love that question. What a complex relationship. And I think that that, that was one of the things that really drew me into the story because I thought about Maud where her mother had, first of all, her mother her mother had had opportunities denied to her. She wanted to go to medical school and follow in her father's footsteps to be a doctor. And they wouldn't allow her to enroll. And actually it wasn't long after that that they did actually allow the first woman to enroll uh, for medical doctor training. So, so Matilda was, was stymied and she spent her whole life really fighting for rights so that her daughter would be able to have those rights. And then along comes Maud. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, now imagine to be Maud, because for one thing, it's like now we think back on these suffragists as these big heroes. But at the time, you know, they were, they were highly, highly controversial, especially you start talking about Susan B. Anthony and Matilda Jocelyn Gage. I mean, at that time, they were so far um, outside the norm. They were definitely not seen as being wonderful, let's help women. They were rabble rousers. Maud's her daughter. Maud just wants to live her life. Maud goes to Cornell where she was really very, very badly harassed, probably even more than what I describe in the book. Um, and so Maud's in a terrible position because I think she loved and admired her mother. But I also think that she, she wasn't maybe as steeled to it as her mother was because her mother had had to enter the fight fighting. And Maud had grown up with, you know, these luminaries of the women's movement all around her in her house. So I think perhaps she was just a little less, um, less toughened up than her mother was. Um, and, and then she, you know, and then she, she drops out of college and goes and runs off with this totally unpromising theater actor. Um, I mean, what a, what an interesting contrast, right? Because if you want to raise your daughters to be independent and do what they want, it, what if what they want to do is what you had in mind for them? So um, I think that they had a great love. I mean, when Matilda left her papers, um, she left them to Frank and Maude. They, they were very intellectually compatible and very, very close, but certainly, you know, strong people with lots of strong ideas. And I, I think it really is a credit to Matilda that she obviously loved, loved Maude and, and did take her as she was. It must've been very hard for her when 
when Maud didn't follow the path that she had kind of set out for her. Um, we have another uh, question from Michael. Why was Frank Baum anti-Native American? That's a really, it's a really good question. And I spent a lot of time looking at it. And I, you know, in the end, I ended up not talking about it in the book um, because it seemed like such a big subject. And, and what this is about, there was, um, when Frank was in Dakota Territory, he had written some, um, he was an, edit, an editor of the newspaper and he was writing a lot of editorials. And he wrote, this was around the time of the um, ghost dancing and the massacre um, uh, at Wounded Knee. And he, he wrote a couple of editorials in which he said something that was so um, vile and, and what you would think would be out of character about essentially advocating genocide, saying that, um, that um, you know, that the Native American, I, I can't quote it exactly, but was once proud and, but because they're now sort of pathetic, we should just basically get rid of all of them. And so there, there are, the Baum family has officially apologized for this. And I, I looked at it and it's sort of, I mean, first of all, it's abhorrent. And I, I don't mean to defend him for it at all. Um, it was either this person who was otherwise progressive in many ways simply just had a blind spot. And I think that that is likely. And I think that very often when you look back at people, um, you know, with their racial attitudes and views um, and they simply, they just didn't see it. And we look back at them now and we say, that's wrong. The, the thing that's, that's sort of a little bit confusing about it is that Matilda herself had been very involved in, um, she was actually an honorary member of the, um, and I'm going to forget the name right now, I think it's Haudenosaunee, but the, it's the tribal in your area. So I'm sorry, it's not fresh in my mind. But anyway, so they, they did have in their family this, this actual, um, you know, respect for Native American traditions. Um, did Frank simply put the Native Americans in the Dakota Territory in a different category because in some way he was perceiving them as a threat to his own safety? Was he being, the other possibility is that he was being, um, uh, that he was basically using hyperbole and that he was being um, not, not um, he was trying to basically ridicule that point of view, which it is maybe possible just because a lot of the um, editorials that he wrote took that that um, that tone. So I don't really know, but I think I decided not to include that in the book because it seemed so complicated that I didn't really think it, my book was the place to do it. But I did spend a lot of time educating myself about it um, because I, I think it's an important question. Um. Uh, I have another question here. Did you do uh, any much research into the Krauss family of Syracuse while you were doing your research through Syracuse? You were the next door neighbor. The, the, the oh, yes, I know. Not, not too much, just, just the amount. A lot of my research that had to do with um, Maud's time at Cornell and mm -hmm. during their courtship was taken from uh, letters that were written by um, other students at Cornell who talked about her and then from some of the biographies of Frank and Maude, but I didn't do any particular further research into that, no. And uh, we have another question from uh, Julie. I have lived in Minnesota, California and central New York and visited the Dakotas. I grew up with Baum's Oz books and the women's rights movies. Plus I'm a theater person. Thank you for this book. Is there any indication Maud's sisters performed an abortion out in the Dakota wilderness, or was it certainly just an, only a miscarriage? Do you know about this? I mean, I mean, if you're talking about the scene in my book, and I, I think that I, um, that that scene is is fiction. So it was. I had access to Maud's sister Julia's diaries, and she kept these very very detailed diaries, and. So when I when it came to the beginning, when I was talking about when you have some room in um, in uh, um, historical fiction, because you don't know. So there was an entry in her diary where she wrote, Julia wrote, "What a terrible night," and then there were some exclamation points, and she wrote nothing else, and. 
And those were, you know, and, and mostly what was in the diary, you know, she would go into great detail about like every single Christmas present she had received or the baby's teething and that kind of thing. But then they, she would slip in these little other things. And, you know, sometimes you just didn't really know. But as far as like what happened to, to her sister, that whole scene that I described, the scene of her baby, Jamie, and, and, and becoming very, very sick and dying, that was actually taken directly from her diaries. The rest of it, the fact that she that she you know was pregnant and, and lost the child or or had a had an abortion that was my that was my fictional construction. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a, another question. I was surprised and somewhat disappointed that Maud decided to drop out of Cornell. It seemed a little out of character. Uh -huh. So do you do you have any uh, anything around her dropping out of Cornell? <laughs> I think, you know, she, I think, yeah, I mean, it seems like, wait a second, she's not supposed to drop out of Cornell. She's the daughter of the famous Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Why would she do that? Um, mm -hmm. But I, I hope that it was clear in the book, the extent to which she was truly being, being harassed. And, and it was quite overt and it was quite ugly what they were doing to them. And but, but I think it's also important to remember that Maud was, um, because she was Matilda's daughter, she was the lightning rod for all of it because there's Matilda and Matilda is out giving speeches about women's suffrage. And um, Matilda was very well known, not in a good way. She was controversial. And, and so I think, but, but also I think you have to, that was Matilda's dream. Maud had her own dream. Maud wanted to follow her own heart she wanted to do what she wanted to do she wanted to go out and have an adventure and to be under all that pressure I think that didn't feel like emancipation and freedom to her so I think I think it does make sense in a way if you think about it that way and uh, Wendy and Alan do you want to talk about any of the events that are happening around Finding Dorothy um, as we're coming to a close and then obviously Elizabeth we want to know what's next on your plate so um, Wendy, if you can tell us uh, what else we have around this. Yes, we have two events locally at Liverpool Library, and people can Zoom them by getting on our website, which is cnmyreads.org. It'll tell you how to uh, join those events. And the first is, um, Alan, help me, the 23rd of uh, March, which is with the women of... The, wonder, uh, the, wonder, the wonderful women of Oz. And thank you. Sue, Sue Bowen from the Matilda Jocelyn Gage House is going to talk about uh, Matilda and Maud. Oh, wonderful. So, Sue Bowen is such a wonderful historian. And yeah. she came to one of my talks, and I very much oh, have enjoyed great. getting to know oh, her. Oh, that's wonderful. Great, yes. Great. Yeah. 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 We're excited about that. And then our last discussion uh, will be at the Liverpool Library on the 25th in the morning. I think it starts at 11. And uh, that will kind of tie things up. But really, the, Sue Boland is, is really our capstone event. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, she's yeah, great. And she's a real expert. Um, there are so many people who are who have have studied the both the Gage family and the Bond family. So much history, so much work went into, into things that I was then able to draw on to write the, the fictional version. Um, but I really hope that people who are interested in the story that reading the novel will take them back. Another book that I would really, really recommend um, is a book by Angelica Carpenter. It's called Born a Criminal. And it's a recent biography of Matilda Jocelyn Gage and it's absolutely excellent. Um, so there's, if you found my novel interesting, if it gave you a little taste, definitely go back. I, I, I think the real people are fascinating and you will be fascinated to learn you know, their real lives are, are as interesting as a novel for sure. Thank you. And can you tell us about the next book you're writing? Absolutely. So I'm going to hold that, hold it up here. I have, I don't know if you can see that here. My next book is called The Ride of Her Life. This is nonfiction. So it's a true story. And it's, it's a, a woman in 1954. Uh, she lived in Maine. She was given a prognosis of two to four years to live and her farm was foreclosed. She had no money. She had always wanted to see the Pacific Ocean just once in her life. And, but she didn't have a car. She didn't have any way to get there. So she decided to get a horse. She took her little dog and she set out from Maine in November to try to see if she could make it to California. So this one's coming in June and I'd be very delighted if, if you guys uh, keep an eye out for it. Thank you. 
Is it nonfiction? It's nonfiction, yes. Nonfiction. I would like to just say one thing, uh, Elizabeth. Um, we almost did not select a book this year because of the pandemic and the fact that we couldn't have in-person book discussions, we considered doing a hiatus. And then somebody on the committee, I don't remember who, mentioned this book. And so Diane we talked Emick. about it. And, pardon? It was Diane Emick, one of our longtime <laughs> yeah, members. Yeah. So, um, uh, so we reconsidered and we chose the book. And I have to say, we're really glad we did because the book discussions um, were so good. And, and the response uh, was, um, I think, better than any of our books before, as far as people saying, I love the book. And oftentimes you get people that say, I didn't like the book, I couldn't finish it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But no, people just said, thank you for choosing this book because I loved it and I might not have picked it up otherwise. And so it was a resounding ap approval across uh, all, of our, uh, our, all of our communities. Well, that is wonderful to hear. And I think, you know, honestly, Frank, the message of, of The Wizard of Oz, which is there's something better out there, you know, uh, during a pandemic, somewhere over the rainbow, I think we can all need to hear that. So yeah. hopefully it was a great book at the right time. And yeah. I'm so grateful that you invited me and I'm so excited that you have Sue Boland coming because I'm a big fan of hers. Good. So um, I hope everybody will show up for that as well. Yeah, yeah this has been really, really lovely. Um, I'm, I'm just re trying to remember, I can't do it, it justice, but I love there's a line that you say that she says, you know, people used to make magic by hand, but now it's being mass produced. But I always feel that with a book, you have the opportunity to see that magic that's being done by hand, and then it's mass produced. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then my editor sneaks in there and makes sure that all my stitches are straight first. So I need her too. <laughs> right. We have a lot of people just saying thank you so much for being with us. Some people are already pre-ordering that book, so it's always a good idea. Your editor <laughs> is smart. Um, and um, also, uh, Wendy and Ellen and CNY Reads, please check out their website, CNY reads.com.org and um is it dot com dot org dot org and so it's cnyreads.org um and um the, where there's so many other uh, events that are happening and um and i want to thank you uh for for being here this evening oh, and thank everyone for being here this evening and uh from everyone here also at syracuse stage because it's like we, we were talking beforehand it's such a great mm -hmm. combination of the literary this, the, the theatrical, the film. And so it's so wonderful when you can put all of that into the book and you can, um, you can almost hear the, 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 the stagehands running around and you, can, you have that wonderful experience of being in that place, which mm -hmm. feels like today, even though it was many, many years ago. Well, thank you. Just one other thing I'd like to say, if readers would like to come to my website, which is my name, elizabethletz.com, um, you can reach me. If you have a burning question that you were dying to answer and I never answered it, I'm pretty good about answering emails and I really don't mind hearing. In fact, I enjoy hearing from readers. So if somebody's thinking, oh, if only I could have asked her, I really don't mind at all and I'd love to hear from you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was wonderful meeting you. You and too. I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed the book and all of our discussions. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed it too. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, thank thank you, you thank all. You. And thanks yeah. for all the people for being here tonight. And, uh, and thank you, Elizabeth, for letting them get to get their questions. We didn't get to all the questions, but thank you for those, uh, for all of you who wrote down your questions and participated tonight. And uh, I'm wishing you all a wonderful evening and a great weekend. So take Good care, night. everybody. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you, Joanne, and all the participants. Bye. Thank Bye. you.